So, hello everyone from Hamburg. Welcome to today's live broadcast about everyday culture practice, improving reproducibility in cell culture. This webinar will be presented by my wonderful and very experienced colleague, Dr. Jessica Wagner, application specialist focusing on cell handling for Eppendorf. I'm Christian Haberhand, marketing manager for instruments and systems at Eppendorf, and I will be your moderator for today's event. At the end of the presentation, I would like to shortly point out some solutions that might be helpful and interesting for you to, to improve your daily work. But before we begin, I would like to encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Simply type them into the Ask a Question box on the left and click on the Send button. We will answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the support tab at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. To obtain your credits, please click on the continuing education credit tab located at the top right of your presentation window and follow the process. Now, let me shortly uh, introduce the presenter of your webinar today. Dr. Jessica Wagner holds a PhD in biology with a focus on and many years of experience in cell culture related topics. Since years, Jessica is amongst the most experienced application specialists focusing on cell handling at Eppendorf headquarters here in Hamburg in Germany. With this experience, Jessica is regular, regularly giving training to new and also very experienced cell culture scientists around the world. And if you're interested in a complete biography, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. We are happy that Jessica is going to share her knowledge with us today, so let's get started. Jessica, the stage is yours. Thank you, Christian, and welcome also from my side for today's presentation. Um, first, let's have a look at the contents of today's presentation. After a short introduction, I will talk about some general aspects that influence reproducibility of different types of cell culture experiments. We will then have a look at the routine culture steps and outline the best methods to improve overall cell quality. In the end, I will touch the topic of misidentified cell lines and give some advice for cell authentication. I want to start with showing you some results of a survey conducted by Nature magazine in 2016. In this survey, more than 1,500 researchers of all different scientific disciplines have been asked if they see a current crisis in reproducibility. More than 50% of researchers surveyed agreed that there is a significant crisis, and taken together, 90% do see reproducibility as a problem in science. Shown here on the right-hand side are the responses to the question if there are man any measures undertaken to enhance pro reproducibility. And although the topic seems to be on people's minds when you have a look at the results of the first question here on the left, Still, more than one-third of the researchers have never established any procedures for reproducibility in their lab. No matter which scientific field you look at, there are a few general principles that should be followed in every scientific process. A rigorous ex experimental design, including proper statistics for robust and unbiased results. A clear and complete documentation of both the experimental procedures and the obtained results transparency in reporting results and experimental details, and the reproduction of results are cornerstones of good scientific practice. Using cultured cells as model system has indisputable benefits. Especially primary cells retain many functions and properties of their parental tissue, which makes them an ideal model system to test new therapeutic approaches. From initial target validation studies through clinical candidate selection to subsequent translational studies, the use of continuous cell lines are, as a renewable resource of cell material is essential across numerous areas of biomedical research. But the cultivation of eukaryotic cells has some major drawbacks that, when overlooked, can lead to severe problems in reproducing experimental data. I think everyone working in a cell culture lab is aware of the risk of having contaminations with microorganisms that overgrow and ruin the cultures. Especially mycoplasmas are difficult to detect and are therefore a special threat in cell culture labs worldwide. Cross-contaminations of different cell lines, which I call eukaryotic contaminations, are a widespread problem that endangers the reliability and reproducibility of experimental data. 
Besides microbial and eukaryotic contamination, it is often overlooked that continuous cell lines, which have an unlimited lifespan, can undergo genetical changes. So although the cells continue to proliferate, their genotypes as well as their phenotype can change over time. The cultivation conditions can have, gr can have great effects on the cells, and here we're not only talking about specific experimental conditions that result in different cellular responses, it's about media formulation, the use of serum, or such simple things as incubator door openings. Cells can respond to the smallest influence. All the risks and drawbacks need to be managed for cell culture experiments to be reproducible. And with this webinar, I want to give you some practical tips how to incorporate certain standards into your cell culture routine that help to improve reproducibility. Um, but before we proceed, here comes our first poll question. Um, so um, you will see it's a very general um, one. Um, the question is, do you think that cell culture experiments are more difficult to reproduce than others? And the answers you can click on are yes, no, or I don't know, and we will wait a couple of seconds um, until the answers are coming in. So again, do you think that cell culture experiments are more difficult to reproduce than others? Yes, no, or I don't know. And um, the votes now are starting to come in. We will wait a couple of seconds more and give you time to answer. Okay, I still see answers coming in, so we will wait a bit more. Okay, and I think we can now slowly close the poll because everyone has answered, and now we would like to show the results to you. So I hope that you can now all see the results. And um, so more than half of you, 55% uh, is, um, or 54% is saying yes, 30% um, does not think that uh, cell culture experiments are more difficult to reproduce, and 16%, almost 17% is not sure about it. Okay, thank you for participating. Um, so let's have a look at the steps that are usually part of the cell culture workflow independent of the specific cell type you are working with. Um, I want to start with the two steps here shown on the right, seeding of cells that are used for an experiment. This is what we are looking at in the next chapter, how to ensure best experimental conditions. Let's have a closer look at this first experimental step that is so important, the seeding of cells. The preconditions for getting comparable results is to seed out the same number of cells for every negative control, positive control, and for every experimental replicate. Um, variations in seeding cell numbers and the formation of air bubbles during seeding will not only increase standard deviations, it will also make your results less reliable. So when you fill, for instance, a multi-well plate with cells, it will take some time until you have filled all the wells. You can use a single-channel pipette and have the cell suspension in a tube, or you can use a multi-channel pipette and have the cell suspension in some type of reservoir. So no matter which tool you use, the longer the seeding process, the higher is the variation in cell numbers from one well to the other. As you see in the image here on the upper right, the cells sink towards the bottom of the tube with time, and this sedimentation goes quite fast within minutes. Therefore, you need to resuspend or mix the cells to swirl them up in between to get an equal number of cells in every well. Saying that, we should keep in mind that cell culture media tend to foam due to the high protein content of supplemented serum, which is usually, usually used. Air bubbles can hinder cell attachment, and in the lower image shown here, you can see how an air bubble hinders the cells nearby to adhere properly to the, to the surface. So you should avoid harsh and fast pipetting to reduce not only the formation of air bubbles, but also to reduce shear forces which further stress the cells. Um, besides this, this, 
sorry, besides seeding an equal cell number in each dish or well, you also want a homogeneous distribution of the cells. So on the lower left image, you see what happens if you pre-fill the vessel with medium and add the cells, and that's it. Um, the cells mainly adhere in the middle where you have brought them in. And there are different techniques how you can disperse the cells evenly. Some people use a figure eight-like movement. Others prefer a cross-like movement of the plate or the dish. And as you can see here, both techniques lead to a better distribution of the cells. But the smaller the diameter of the culture vessel, the less liquid movement you have. So instead of pre-filling the vessels with medium and add, adding the cells in a second step, you can first dilute the cell suspension to the desired concentration in a tube, so preparing a kind of master mix, and then add the complete volume in one step. Thus, you have an even cell distribution throughout the complete vessel and the cell attached homogeneously to the, to the surface. And here I show you an example how uniform cell adhesion can have an impact on your experiment. In these experiments, we transected cells with a GFP expression construct and imaged them later on. And as you see in these images, transfection efficiency is sensitive to cell density. The optimum for transfection is a medium density, and when you have an evenly distributed cell layer, you have a uniform transfection efficiency. And as you can see in this quantification, in the areas with medium density, you have the highest transfection efficiencies. In this experiment, it was between 50 and 60 percent. In the dish with the uneven distributed cells, the efficiency varied between 26 and 56 percent, which in total gives you a lower transfection success rate and a much higher standard deviation. Another example how, to hand, how the handling of cells can influence your experimental outcome is the pipetting technique in cell-based assays. In this graph here, you see the results of a cell viability assay. Each column represents one row of a 96-well plate. The aim was to seed an identical number of cells in each well. Two rows were left out for blanks. The cells were seeded with a manual eight-channel pipette, and after 24, 24 hours, the number of viable cells was determined using a colorimetric assay. Um, in rows one to five, you see varying cell numbers in the wells and therefore quite high standard deviations. Here the user did not mix the cell suspension between pipetting each row, so the cell sedimented in the reservoir with time. And in addition, the pipette was held in different angles and heights during aspiration. In rows six to 10, you see the results with mixing the remaining cells before pipetting each row, aspirating at constant height and in upright position. So taken together, these data show that the pipetting technique has a big influence on the results. And besides the technique, the other thing that can affect results of an assay are the so-called plate position effects. If you work with 96-well plates, the usual volume you use is 100 to 200 microliters per well. During longer incubation periods, um, evaporation can become a critical factor with a small volume, especially in the outer wells. Because here the wells are not surrounded by other wells with warm liquid inside, the evaporation become more severe. This is a phenomenon that we call the edge effect. So the outer wells of the plate cannot be used because the evaporation lead to different cellular responses. What you can do to avoid this effect is to fill the outer wells only with medium or PBS to insulate the inner wells. And if you do that, you can avoid the edge effect, but you reduce the number of usable wells to 60, which is a lossing capacity of 38% per plate. The Eppendorf cell culture plate has a surrounding mold that can be filled with liquid, and thus the outer wells get insulated and the evaporation effects are minimized. And here we measured how effectively the edge effect is reduced in the Eppendorf plate. Without insulation, the evaporation in standard cell culture plates can go up to 15, almost 20%. And again, if you think about a volume of 100 to 200 microliters per well, and you want to test maybe different concentrations of a substance, over time the evaporation will influence the concentration of the substance and the cellular responses are not comparable anymore. And one exa example is shown here on the right. We did a simple proliferation assay, and you can see the various cellular responses when the outer wells are not insulated like in the Eppendorf plate. So with insulating the outer wells, you ensure stable conditions throughout the complete plate. In addition to stable conditions in the plate, the conditions for the cells in the CO2 incubator should be as stable as possible. Every time the door of the incubator is open, the atmosphere inside is disturbed. 
It is a good advice to reduce the traffic in and out of the incubator as much as possible. Only open the door when necessary and close it as soon as possible. And the incubator should have a quick recovery of CO2 and temperature levels after door opening. Some incubator brands achieve that by an overshoot, especially in temperature, but this can be harmful for the cells. So a good incubator is able to recover temperature and gas level within a few minutes after door opening and without any overshoot. Especially when you work with very sensitive cells or when you work in a lab where many people are sharing an incubator, it can be a good idea to have a separate incubator for maintenance, cultures, and running experiments. So you seed the cells for an experiment, do the treatment, manipulation, or whatever you want to do, and then put the cells into a separate incubator for the time of the experiment. Your colleague who must split the cells or change the medium uses the other incubator, and thus your experiment is not disturbed by fluctuations of the incubation atmosphere. So again, here is an overview of the general cell culture workflow. In the next chapter, I want to talk about some aspects, how you can improve the overall quality of your cells, because not only the experiment itself plays a role, plays a role when it comes to reproducibility, also the routine steps like freezing and passaging and the cultivation itself can be a critical factor. Um, but before we go on, I would like to start the next poll question. Um, I'm interested in the cell types you're working with. So the answers you can click on are continuous cell lines, primary cells, or both. And again, we will wait a couple of seconds until the answers are coming in. So we are interested in the cell type you're working with, continuous cell lines, primary cells, or both. And I see that the answers are slowly coming in now. We will again wait a few seconds. Okay, I see still some answers are coming in. Okay, so I think we are now closing uh, the poll and show the results to you. Okay, and so we see 50% of you, almost 50% is using continuous cell lines, only 10% is only using primary cells, and um, around 40, 41% of you is using, using both continuous cell lines as well as primary cells. All right, thank you for participating. Um, so no matter which cell types you are working with, there are some ways to optimize the routine culture steps to improve the overall quality of your cells. Um, I want to start with the cryopreservation of cells and cell banking. So during freezing and thawing of cells, the stress factors should be minimized. Having high quality cell stocks is your backup system and the prerequisite for reliable research. Um, maybe the most important point is that you make sure that you don't freeze contaminated cells and that the cell line is really the cell line you think it is. So authentication of cell lines should be performed regularly, especially when you got the cells from another lab and when you use them in long-term or subsequent studies. The cells you are working with should also be tested for mycoplasma regularly. Filter tips give you extra safety, so they should be considered at least for such important steps like cell banking. The routine use of antibiotics is not recommended because they can mask a contamination with partially resistant bacteria. A two-stage cell banking system with a master and a working stock, like shown here on the right, provides you constantly with early passages from your cell lines. And finally, a detailed record of the cell stocks is as important as clear labeling of cryotubes. Um, no matter what you do with a cell culture, freezing, subculturing, or seeding cells for an experiment, it is important to determine the right time point for a particular cell type. In this image, you see a typical growth curve of cells in culture. 
It is important to not let the cells overgrow until they are in their stationary phase and do not proliferate anymore. The optimal time point is when the cells are in their exponential growth phase, also called log phase, and this is when they are between 70 and 80 percent confluent. Plotting a cell growth curve like you see here and determining the population doubling time for a cell line is critical for understanding the optimal seeding density and the optimal cell concentration range for the routine subculturing of the cell line. When you launch an experiment, it is important that you can be sure that any changes in cellular behavior that you see are a direct response to an experimental stimulus. For example, you want to test how the cells react to the treatment with a certain substance, so you add the substance to your cells and see increased cell death or the proliferation rate slows down. And to evaluate a direct correlation between the changes in your cell culture and the experiment you performed, a constant culture routine is important. A growth curve provides information about cell behavior during cultivation and thus facilitates the assessment whether any biological response can be attributed to the effect of a tested factor or whether it may reflect an imbalance within the culture system itself. Another factor that has often been ascribed in literature to influence cellular behavior is the passage number. The passage number is a record of the number of times a cell culture has been subcultured. There are numerous studies giving evidence that the passage number affects a cell line's characteristics over time. It has been described that cell lines at high passage number experience alterations in morphology, response to stimuli, growth rates, protein expression, transfection efficiency, and more. So looking at all these passage number effects in different cell types described in the literature, the basic question one can think of is how many passages are too many? And before we go on, I would like to hand over this question to you and start our next poll. What do you think? How many passages can a cell line be cultured for? And the answers you can click on are not more than 20 passages, 20 to 60 passages, up to 100 passages, or the passage number has no influence on the cells. So I, I will read the question again. How many passages can a cell line be cultured for? Not more than 20 passages, 20 to 60 passages, up to 100 passages, or the passage number has no influence on the cells. And again, I will wait a few seconds and give you time to answer the question. Okay, and the answers are slowly coming in. We will wait a couple of seconds more. Okay, and I think we can slowly close the survey now and show the results to you. Okay, so we see that almost 44% um, has clicked on not more than 20 passages. Almost the same number, around 40%, says 20 to 60 passages is okay. Only 10% um, says up to 100 passages, and almost 5% does not think that the passage number has an influence on the cells. Thank you again for participating. We will go on with the presentation. So in general, we can say keep the passage number as low as possible. As possible. Especially primary cells that have a finite lifespan are prone to genotypic and phenotypic changes as they adapt to in vitro cultures. So after a number of population doublings, they will just stop growing. In contrast, continuous cell lines like cancer cells, for example, have an unlimited lifespan. But although they can proliferate indefinitely, also their genotype and phenotype can change over time. A lot of the well-established and well-characterized cell lines that are used in laboratories worldwide have been isolated from their original tissue decades ago. So when you work with such an old cell line, it is most likely not possible to obtain early passages from this cell line. But you must set a starting point as a reference to be able to obtain reliable results, of course, with these cells. 
So first of all, the starting point should be cells of high quality. The best way to ensure this high quality is obtaining cells, cells from one of the established cell banks or cell repositories. Here you get well-documented, authenticated cell lines, which serve as the best reference culture for your experiments. By establishing a two-stage cell banking system, like I showed you in one of the previous slides, with a master and a working stock, you have a constant supply of early passages from your cell line. Now you can determine the safe passage number for your cell line of interest by establishing certain baselines, for example, test the cells for the presence and expression level of a certain marker protein that you're interested in. Um, you can monitor the proliferation rate over time, keep an eye on any changes in cellular morphology. So basically, by getting to know your cells, you will get an idea of whether and how the cells change in relation to prolonged passaging. And maybe a very simple tip, do not keep cells in culture that are not actively used for experiments. So don't passage continuously, but rather establish new cells from frozen stock if required. As I already mentioned, it is important that you get to know your cells, no matter which step you perform. First, take a closer look with a microscope. Not only check the cells for possible contamination, but also to reveal the status of your cell culture. There's a lot of things besides contamination and confluency that, you, that can be checked with a simple bright field microscope. We've already heard about techniques to avoid that the cells accumulate in one area of the growth surface, like you see in this image in the upper right compared to the lower left side. Um, other things that you should draw your attention that should draw your attention when looking through the microscope are changes in cell morphology. Um, for example, increased granularity, especially those observed around the nucleus, um, ovaculation of cytoplasm can be indicators of an unhealthy culture. In some cases, it simply requires a change of medium, whereas in other cases, a more serious problem may be present, such as microbial contamination, senescence of the cell line, or inadequate medium or serum. As I already mentioned, cell culture media tend to build up a lot of foam and air bubbles easily form during pipetting steps. When seeding cells, air bubbles can hinder cell attachment. Um, when cells die, they will take on a round appearance, detach from the surface and float in the medium. Increased cell loss due to apoptosis or necrosis is a clear sign of an unhealthy culture that should be replaced by starting a fresh culture from frozen stock. And as thawing is always a stress factor for the cells, it is normal to observe a number of dead cells floating in the medium of a recently thawed culture. Um, a medium change should be performed one day after thawing, so the cells... Um, uh, so to avoid that the cells, that there's any accumulation of toxic products from dead cells in the medium. Um, proliferating cells, like you see here, are a sign of a healthy culture. When cells undergo mitosis, they assume a round shape and partly detach from the surface before they segregate into two daughter cells that will adhere again and assume their characteristic morphology. As mentioned before, when cell density is too high, cells will stop proliferating for this reason, passaging at 70 to 80 percent confluence is recommended. Constantly monitoring the cells is crucial to reveal possible contaminations at early stages and avoid spreading of the contamination. For microbial contaminations like fungi, yeast, and bacteria, a standard bright field microscope is sufficient to discover a contamination. In a lot of cases, they are even visible with the naked eye as color changes and turbidity of the medium appears. There is one type of bacteria that is not so easy to detect, though. Um, Mycoplasmas are too small to be seen in a standard microscope, and they don't visibly change the culture medium. So the risk of spreading a mycoplasma contamination throughout the lab is high because mycoplasmas are able to penetrate 0.2 micrometer fil filter pores. Therefore, cultures need to be tested for mycoplasma regularly. When contamination with mycoplasma or any other type of contamination go undergoes, goes undetected, it endangers the reliability and reproducibility of experimental data. Besides regular testing and disposal of infected cultures, using the right filters can help to avoid spreading a mycoplasma contamination. Um, I already mentioned filter tips um, for pipetting, which is always a good idea in cell culture. When you filtrate liquids like media, for instance, you should use filters with a 0.1 micrometer pore size. And um, also the type of T-flask that you use can make a difference as well. And these images here 
you see what happens when mycoplasma containing culture medium comes in contact with a 0.2 micron membrane filter, which is usually part of a standard screw cap in T flasks. It has more or less parallel fibers that form the filter pores. In contrast to that, the Eppendorf T flask, shown here on the right hand side, has a screw cap with a so called depth filter with pores of various sizes forming a labyrinth like structure. This doesn't allow mycoplasma to pass through the filter, whereas the airflow is not affected. So, for example, when medium is accidentally slewed against the filter, a standard screw cap with a membrane filter, like here shown on the left, is no barrier for the contaminants and the mycoplasmas can spread throughout the lab. There are not many cell culture quality standards defined in detail and others performed differently between labs and sometimes even within the same lab. So usually everyone is treating their cells a bit different and this is one of the reasons that contributes to non-reproducibility of experimental data. A constant and detailed documentation helps to ensure that a cell line is always handled the same way. The source should be recorded by quoting the original designation of the cell line. The accession number should be retained if the cell line was obtained from a cell bank. Especially when establishing a new cell line, a unique name prevents ambiguity with respect to other cell lines or biological resources. Um, also important is an overview of culture conditions and procedures, including information about medium composition, growth surface, thawing density, etc. The culture conditions should be adapted for each individual cell line. Reference images of the cells at different densities help to recognize any unusual changes in cell morphology, especially when new people come to the lab or when you start to work with a new cell line. These images help to get familiar with how the cells are supposed to look like when the culture is healthy. Images with different cell densities show how the morphology can change with increasing confluency. In Cell Culture Lab, it is common that different people take care about the cells during the week. Um, on, day, on day one, person A is changing the medium. The next day, person B is splitting the cells. Um, but even if you are the only person working with the cells, think, things like passage number, seeding number, split ratio, as well as cell viability should be constantly documented. And by the way, when the cell viability drops below 80%, it is recommended that you reinitiate new cells from frozen stock to make sure that you cultivate a healthy culture. You can um, create such a cell profile that I show you here for every cell type you are working with and every colleague who is working with the same culture should have access to it. On eppendorf.com slash cell experts, we provide a PDF template for download, which you can print out and use in your cell culture lab. When we talk about documentation and monitoring to improve reproducibility, the CO2 incubator should be part of it. Um, here on the lower right, you see a screenshot of the menu of the new Eppendorf Cell Expert CO2 incubator. Um, the red arrow indicates a door opening, and you see that the curves of CO2 and temp temperature are dropping. So monitoring cultivation parameters and documenting performance of your incubator are measures to establish long-term reproducibility of the experiments in your lab. You can simply check for door openings or track back the performance data to see what might have influenced your experiment this time. So looking into the performance of your incubator should be part of troubleshooting an experiment. There's one important source of variability that cannot be overlooked when we talk about reproducibility in cell culture. Animal serum is a standard supplement of cell culture media. The most commonly used serum is fetal bovine serum, also known as fetal calf serum or FCS. It is added to the culture medium at a concentration usually of 10 to 20%. It contains vital nutrients, hormones, growth factors which stimulate cell growth, and other serum components serve as binding proteins which promote cell adhesion in vitro. Although the use of serum is well established in cell culture, it remains the most undefined component of culture media. Serum batches usually show qualitative variations and the lack of uniformity in composition introduces high batch-to-batch -batch variability. Um, so the develop development of serum-free media and serum substitutes is increasing. A variety of chemically defined serum-free media and synthetic serum substitute is available from different suppliers. Despite of the ethical issue that come along with the use of animal-derived substances for some applications, it is crucial to have a complete animal-free um, culture environment. 
So one example are bioprocess applications, such as the production of a therapeutic protein or vaccines. Um, also for the cultivation of stem cells, researchers want to resign the use of serum because stem cells are known to react very sensitive upon the slightest variation in culture conditions. However, there is not yet an alternative for all cell types available. In addition, the alternatives to FPS that are available are usually very costly. Um, so there are a few things you might consider to avoid the variability of serum affecting cell-based experiments. It is recommended to test different serum batches for their ability to support growth of a certain cell type and to stock up on a suitable batch. It is also possible to request that serum suppliers reserve appropriate volumes of a suitable batch, and when the batch is used up, testing should be repeated to identify the next one, suitable one. Um, and I want to point out here that when you test a new batch of serum and find it to increase the growth of your um, cell significantly, it is not necessarily beneficial for the reproducibility of previous results you obtained with these cells. So you should not simply screen for the lot that makes the cells grow, grow fastest. As I already mentioned, for finding a safe passage number for your intended study, testing of different serum batches should be tailored for your intended use. So, for example, have a look at the expression of certain marker genes of interest and monitor cell morphology with different serum batches. And the last important point here is transparency. So when you report how you screen or test serum, you enable others to reproduce the data more easily. As already said, for some applications, it becomes more and more important to completely resign animal components from the culture system. This also includes the surface or substrate the cells are growing on. But switching from a biological surface coating to a synthetic growth surface can require some adaption time as the cells need to get used to the new conditions. Um, so one example would be adapting human pluripotent stem cells from biological derived laminin um, to a synthetic coating substrate. During the adaption phase, it is highly recommended to change one culture parameter at a time. So first let the cells adapt to that one changed culture condition and then initiate the next change afterwards. So here you see some tips for growth surface transition specific specifically for human pluripotent stem cells. Um, it is recommended to seed a higher initial cell density than usually used during routine culture. The seeding density can then be decreased or vice versa. The split ratio can be increased progressively until complete cell adaption on the new surface is reached. During surface transition, clump passaging should be preferred, which is a technique that is quite specific for human PSCs. So using a complete and highly nutritive medium supplement with an apoptosis inhibitor for 24 hours post-seeding facilitates the, process, uh, the transition process as well. A slightly higher occurrence of spontaneous deferration might be observed, but will decrease to a normal level for PSC cultures after complete adaption. A daily microscopical check will reveal morphological changes and differentiated areas should be manually removed before passaging. When PSCs are stable on the new surface, the complete and highly nutritive medium can be gradually substituted with another, maybe synthetic medium, to establish a complete defined culture system. And with this, I come to the last chapter of this webinar, Misidentified Cell Lines. A misidentified cell line develops from a cross-contamination of two different cell lines. Usually, this happens by an accident somewhere during the handling of the cells. Um, mislabeling of samples and inconsistent nomenclature of cell lines also contribute to this phenomenon. As soon as two cell types are mixed up, it is very hard to distinguish them. This process, process goes fast and it might go undetected, especially if the morphology of the cells is not drastically different. Um, but although the phenomenon of cross-contaminated and misidentified cell lines has been recognized for more than half a century, still to date we know that 15 to 20 percent of all cell lines used worldwide are either cross-contaminated or misidentified. Currently, more than 500 cell lines are known um, to be cross-contaminated mis or misidentified, and the list, unfortunately, is still growing. So um, misidentified or cross-contaminated cell lines are a big contributor to non-reproducible research, and therefore it's very important to check the identity of the cell lines you are working with. For human cell lines, identity testing can be performed using short tandem repeat or STR profiling. 
Um, the analysis of short tandem repeats has become the standard for intraspecies identity testing of human cell lines. STR profiling can be performed in-house only if the required equipment is available. Adequate interpretation of the data requires high expertise and routine, so it can be more advisable to use a service provider for cell authentication. The development of markers for authentication of non-human cell line is still an ongoing process, and more reliable polymeric STR markers which can provide intraspecies discrimination must be identified. So there are several different methods like karyotyping, isoenzyme profiling, and DNA barcoding um, available to detect interspecies and intraspecies cross-contamination in cell cultures. More information is available on our website again. And with this, I will hand over to Christian again. So thank you, Jessica, for this nice presentation. That was a lot of material that we covered here. So before we will start with the last poll question and the Q&A session, I promised you to give you a quick overview onto new or helpful cell culture solutions that might be um, very helpful for your daily work, especially in regards to more reproducible results. And the first thing I would like to show you is uh, our new CO2 incubator, the cell expert, which you can see here on this image. Here's a little overview of that. So it was uh, um, designed for providing highly reliable culture conditions. Um, we have optimized growth conditions, so we have a temperature and CO2 recovery below five minutes. Um, it comes with a fanless design and a seamless chamber, so it's easy um, to, to clean and provides you a reliable contamination protection. It also offers highly uniform temperature that is verified at 27 spots inside the incubator um, according to a German uh, norm here. It comes also with a 180 degrees high temperature disinfection as a standard, provides up to 25% more usable space due to the fanless design and has a very small footprint. It's very easy to clean, to use, and also documentation is very easy to do because we all know that uh, documentation is not uh, going to be less in the future. It's getting more and more. And uh, as a special for all devices that are sold uh, last year and this year, um, we offer a five-year um, extended warranty for all devices that are sold this year. And if you want to learn more about the Cell Expert or th uh, see it in 360 degrees, you can go to um, eppendorf.com slash cell expert. The next thing I would like to show you is uh, about our cell culture consumables. Uh, one thing I would like to point out here is uh, our, our, our cell culture flask which are 100% mycoplasma safe um, with a new and advanced filter technology. So um, when you compare the filter to standard filters, it, um, it prevents mycoplasma to go either from the outside to the inside or um, from the inside to the outside. And if you want uh, more information or if you're interested in current promotions of our cell culture flask, you can go to eppendorf.com slash ccc minus shop. And another thing I would like to show you is uh, if you're working with stem cells, especially with uh, um, iPSCs or MSCs, um, I would like to show you our new CCC Advanced FN1 Motors Cultureware for more reproducible results. It has a fully defined synthetic coating. No coating preparation is needed, so it's ready to use for you, and you can also use it for feeder-free cell culture and restrictive culture conditions and if you're interested in that and you want to request a sample pack or if you're interested in detailed IPSC or MSC expansion analysis, you can go to eppendorf.com slash ccc minus advance. And the last thing I would like to show you is our new newsletter. So you're, if you're interested in new upcoming webinars and if you like the content that we presented uh, for you today, um, I would like to um, point out our Inside Cell Culture newsletter for cell culture professionals. There you get regular information about tips and tricks, how to improve your daily work, free videos, downloads, posters, and more. Also access to all advanced educational webinars. Um, um, you also receive support for your teaching, upcoming events, trainings, and webinars. And if you would like to sign up and get a free download poster, go to eppendorf.com slash insidecellculture. So, with this, um, let's come to the last poll question. How do you rate the content of today's webinar? And the answers you can click is very good, good, okay, or poor. 
So while you click on that, I would like to thank you very much for your responses. We will now start with the live Q&A portion of the webinar. So if you have any questions you would like to ask Jessica, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We will answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started because I've seen that during the presentation there were a lot of questions coming in. And our first question is, does the use of antibiotics in cell culture media influence the reproducibility? Jessica, what do you say about this? Um, thank you for this question. Um, yeah, so there are quite a few um, pieces of literature out there that show that antibiotics have an influence on the cell cultures and especially because the um, use of antibiotics is not standardized, um, it can have um, different effects on reproducibility, of course. So when you think about a certain cell line and you um, screen the literature um, for papers with that cell line, usually it is not reported um, how they are cultivated. Maybe the medium um, is reported, but uh, most of the time um, it says n the material methods section uh, say nothing um, about the use of antibiotics, um, how they were used, what concentrations were used. Um, when you think about um, the famous penicillin and streptomycin um, combination, for instance, um, there are people that um, add it once to their media bottle and then um, use that f um, that uh, media bottle until it's um, until it's empty. Um, others um, add it every time um, fresh to the medium. So the use is just very different and not standardized. So um, I would say, yeah, um, the use of antibiotics has an influence on reproducibility, and I would generally not recommend um, to use antibiotics. So thank you for that. The next question is uh, probably related to the edge effect that uh, you all know, and the question is, is it advisable to fill the outer walls of a 96 well plate with media, Jessica? Um, yeah, so when you have a standard cell culture plate, not the Epinoff plate, which I um, talked about, you can um, um, use the um, outer wells only, or you can fill the outer wells only with um, medium, or you can basically use any sterile liquid um, that, you, um, that you have in hand. So you could also use PBS, which is usually present in cell culture labs, or you can use sterile water. Um, and simply to, to create an, uh, an insulation of the inner well. So um, the disadvantage if you, use, uh, if you do that is you can only use 60 wells, so only the 60 inner wells, and you can't, cannot use the complete capacity of the plate, um, but thus the edge effect um, is definitely reduced, yeah. yeah. Thank you. The next question is related to centrifugation and thawing. So the question is, should I centrifuge the cells right after thawing them? Um, this will depend on the um, cell type you're working with. So there are some cells that are very sensitive um, for that centrifugation step uh, when they are freshly thawed, and other cells are more sensitive to um, the DMSO that is used um, in the freezing medium. So um, if you are not sure which is the best method, I would just recommend that you try that you that you thaw two um, vials with the same cell concentration, and then um, for one you do the centrifugation step right after thawing them, and the others um, the other cryotube you just dilute with standard medium, and um, then you you do a check of the viability one or two days after. No matter how you do it, if with centrifugation or without, I would definitely. Um, change the medium um, one day um, after thawing because, as I mentioned, um, thawing is always stress factor for the cells, so you will have more dead cells swimming in the medium that, um, uh, yeah, and you will have toxic products in the medium from these dead cells. So I would definitely change um, the medium 24 hours post thawing and then have it check the viability um, uh, and then decide um, which procedure you, you will apply for that cell line. And I would do it for every individual cell line differently. So um, I would check for every cell line that I work with. Okay, we have a lot of uh, questions here, so we have to choose wisely, which uh, is going to be the next question. 
Um, another interesting question that we has, uh, have is, uh, what is the best way to mix cells in the reservoir? Um, here I would simply um, resuspend. So pipette a few times up and down um, to swirl the cells up um, because this is basically the, yeah, more or less the only way to do it properly and to avoid any, um, any spilling. Um, but you should not um, overdo it. So resuspend or pipette up and down two, maybe three times, and that is sufficient because if you do it too often, you will create shear forces which further stresses the cells, and that is not, um, that is not what you want to achieve. Okay, thank you for that. Next question that we have uh, chosen is, what test do you recommend for testing for micro, uh, mycoplasma? Um, there are different test methods available, so it depends a little bit on, of course, which equipment you have access to in your lab and um, how many uh, samples do you want to test um, at once, uh, how long can you wait for the for the test results. So um, uh, I would... Um, I would say a PCR, for instance, is a very straightforward um, method, um, and, but of course it depends on if you have a cycler in your lab. Um, what is often done, because it's very, um, a very low-cost method and very um, yeah, quick and easy, is um, DNA staining, so for instance, DAPI staining um, of, uh, of the cells. So this can be um, a good method, but only if you have a very um, high level of mycoplasma um, contamination. So, because it cannot distinguish between mycoplasma DNA and DNA of the cell. So, if you have um, cell debris, for instance, in your culture, um, then you cannot really distinguish is it, um, is it DNA of the mycoplasma or is it DNA um, of, um, yeah, DNA from any cell debris. So, um, I would recommend this DNA staining only as a first step and then maybe um, do a PCR afterwards. So thank you. And the next question that is re just related to that is how often would you recommend to test for mycoplasma then? Um, so that will depend on, on the lab, I would say. So it depends on how many people are working in the lab, how many people are sharing equipment, maybe also um, if you work in a university lab, how many not so experienced people you have, um, how is their status, uh, status of, of um, knowledge when it comes to aseptic techniques. So I would um, start with a higher testing frequency, um, maybe once a month, and then see how the results are and then decide if, if you stick to that high frequency um, or if you can go to um, yeah every eight weeks. Um, I know labs that do it every half a year and are fine with that. But it will depend on um, yeah on the people in your lab, on on the um, knowledge that is there, and on the um, uh, yeah how the how the lab is running. So there is no um, there is no recommendation or no general recommendation to that. All right. Let's see. Another question um, regarding bacterial infection is, uh, does bacterial infection always make the medium cloudy? Um, I don't know if there may be a bacterium, uh, bacterial species that does not make the medium cloudy. So in general, I would say, yes, this always happens. But of course, it depends um, on, the, on the status of infection. So if you only have a few bacteria um, you not instantly see um, the medium become cloudy or the color change. So, um, um, yeah, but in general, I, um, I think, yes, it's always a sign of bacterial contamination um, when, the, when the medium becomes turbid. Thank you for this answer. I think we have another four minutes left and another interesting question is how many passages should be used for cell culture I know it's dependent on the cell line but what is the safe or general number of passages unfortunately that was what I was trying to point out um, during the presentation there is no general number of passages um, that is safe so um, you have to consider um, not so much the passage number, because when you think about, I don't know, HeLa cells, for instance, the first human cell line that has been established in the early 1950s, 
um, this um, this airline is now um, uh, uh, 70 years old, so you you cannot obtain passage one or five of these cells, or there are numerous other cell lines um, that are um, that old. So um, what you should more consider is the time that the cells are in culture. So um, for instance, when you say, okay, I cultivate not more than 20 passages and um, 20 passages in my lab with my throughput means that the cells are, I don't know, in culture for three weeks, that would be um, for instance, one thing that you can think of. Um, but unfortunately, as I as I mentioned, there is no general recommendation. Passage number 20 or passage number 50 is okay. And it, as you as you mentioned in your question, it is cell line dependent. So as always in biology, the answer is not a clear yes or no. It's uh, somewhere in between. So let's look for a next question. Um, Next one is, which is more representative of cell age, passage number or doubling number? Definitely the doubling number. So because the passage number is only um, yeah, a, a measure of um, uh, how long the passage is in culture, but it does not give information how many times um, the cells have been, uh, yeah, have multiplied or have doubled in that time. So the doubling number is... Um, uh, gives you information about the, the age of the cells. So, thank you for that. Another few questions uh, we have time for. What are the consequences of continually culturing cells at 100% confluency? Um, this is basically a permanent um, stress situation for the for the cells because you um, when you have 100% confluency, the cells slow down in, in, in proliferation because they have no space and then they stop proliferation and um, um, start uh, senescence and start dying. So you constantly um, have your cells in a stress situation. So of course the cells, especially when it's a very robust cell line, they some cells always survive. Um, but um, the overall quality of the of the cell culture is um, is decreasing. So you um, you might get problems with reproducing um, experiments, um, and um, you also when you split the cells at 100% confluency, you prolong um, the the stationary phase of that cell growth curve. Then in the next bottle, so the um, the cells. Um, have a longer time um, or need longer time to recover from that <clears throat> situation of 100% confluency. Okay. I think we have time for one more question and uh, we're choosing wisely. Let's see. Find a question that is relevant to... A a lot of people, because we have a lot of very specific questions here, around 90 questions uh, all over. So I would like also to remind you um, that any questions we don't have time to answer today will be answered via email after the, after the sessions. After the session, so don't worry, all your questions are being answered. And the last question uh, we chose is, is there any case is there any case I must use antibiotics? Um, okay, so um, there can be some situations where um, it's a good idea to use antibiotics, but it's not a must. So, for instance, when you freshly isolate um, primary cells from, from tissue, um, you can add antibiotics um, because um, isolating um, cells from tissue, um, you, cannot, you cannot sterilize that tissue before. So um, it probably brings... Um, the contamination, um, um, yeah, with the tissue. So um, you can add antibiotics, um, for instance, for the first two weeks after you establish the primary culture um, to, to get rid of these, yeah, more or less endogenous um, contaminations. And, um, but then I would, um, I would uh, uh, remove the antibiotics from the culture system. And, of course, there might be also cases um, where you want to, um, want to do um, a selection uh, with antibiotics um, when you have anti any antibiotic resistance gene um, um, as a selective marker um, transfected in your cells. But 
Um, other than that, um, there is no case that I can think of where antibiotics are a must. So thank you all very much for contributing here and sending in all of the of, all of your questions here. Jessica, do you have any final comments for our audience? Um, thank you for your attention and um, also thank you for all the um, interesting questions that you have sent in. There are many more that we didn't have time to answer now or that we don't have time to answer now, um, but um, we will answer all questions via emails within the next um, one or two weeks. So be sure that you um, um, get an answer to your question um, within the next time. So before we go, I would like to thank you all for joining us today and for your good questions. And I would like also to thank Jessica, um, especially for her time today and for her insightful presentation. We hope you enjoyed it as well as we did and that it will be useful for your everyday, for your everyday work. We would also like to thank LabRoots for supporting us with today's educational webcast. And uh, this webcast can be viewed uh, on demand afterwards. And LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. And we encourage you all to share this via email with your colleagues who maybe have missed this uh, today's uh, live webinar. And after we close the window, uh, I heard uh, before we started the session that uh, LabRoots has a new feature here. After you close the window, you will be redirected to our next um, cell culture related webinar about how to improve stem cell culture on June 18th. So you can directly sign up if you want, uh, if you enjoyed it today. So we say goodbye from Hamburg today. Have a nice day. Bye.